Welcome to the disturbing CCTV iceberg part one of two. If you don't know me, my name is Hannah. I do videos on creepy and disturbing things. I'm going to get into the video as quickly as possible, but unfortunately there's just a few disclaimers that I have to put on this particular video. So I'll try to go as quickly as possible. There's timestamps in the description. If you're sure you want to miss the disclaimers, you can go ahead. Disclaimer one. Obviously, I did not invent the idea of iceberg memes. This is not my idea. However, I did create this particular iceberg myself. This video was definitely inspired by Wendigoon, who does a lot of iceberg videos, and he does a really great job. I probably said his name wrong, so I'm really sorry if I did, but I definitely got inspired from him. Disclaimer number two, there is just like a ton of CCTV footage out there, especially of crimes. I mean, there's thousands and thousands, so I got as many as I could to make a reasonably length video and the ones that are seemingly, you know, the most popular. However, I'm sure I've missed some. And if you think I did, then feel free to share in the comments. Disclaimer number three, I'm going to be going over each case so that there's context around the footage. However, of course, I can't go into detail or this video would be 12 hours long. That being said, if there's a particular case in this iceberg video that you want me to make its own video about and go super in depth, please again, let me know in the comments. Number four, I know that iceberg charts are kind of a meme, but just so you know, this is a serious iceberg chart. So all these stories are extremely fascinating and even more disturbing because there's actual CCTV footage that accompanies them. Please remember that all of these cases involve real victims, real family, real people. Just because one case is ranked higher or lower than the other on the chart does not mean that that particular case or victim is any more or less important than another one. The tiers in the iceberg chart are mostly based on how well known they are. The tip of the iceberg being very well known in mainstream and no, less and less well known as we go down. Five. With that all being said, obviously major trigger warning for like all of the things. None of the videos are going to be extremely like visually graphic, but we are going to be mentioning everything traumatic and the stories might be too disturbing for some audience. Some of the things that we're going to mention include child sexual assault, child murder, adult sexual assault, adult murder, torture, Side, just every heinous act you can think of. Just keep that in mind and I won't be offended if you click off if you decide that this is not the video for you. The point is that it's extremely disturbing. Six, when I say CCTV footage, I'm talking about home security cameras or security cameras out on the streets or in stores. That means that CCTV footage does not include body cams or crimes that were recorded on cell phones and things like that. That is not CCTV. This is specifically some kind of security camera catching this footage. So that was all the actual disclaimers. Let's explain the actual iceberg. So the iceberg goes from tier one to tier five. Tier one, the tip of the iceberg being cases that are pretty well known and infamous all the way down to tier five, which are not only not as well known, but in my opinion, the most atrocious crimes. I will be doing tier one and two in this video in part Part one, and then I'll be doing tier three, four, and five in a part two, which I will post in a few days or as soon as I can. Of course, if you hear of any of the unsolved cases in this video and you know something about them, please email me. My email's in the description and I will help you find the local police department to report anything because it would be cool if any of these crimes were ever solved if because a lot of them are unsolved. Thank you so much for bearing with me. I know that was a long intro. I usually hate long intros, but for this particular video, it was necessary. Let's get into it. Here is tier one. The first one is the disappearance of Lars Mittank. In July of 2014, 28 year old Lars was vacationing in a resort in Varna, Bulgaria. He had gotten in a bar fight during this vacation. According to Lars's friends, Lars came back all beaten up and claimed that four men came and beat him up after they got in a disagreement over football in one of the bars they were at. Because of the injuries he sustained, he couldn't fly home with his friends. And yes, they did offer to stay with him, but he insisted that they go home. He stayed and all of a sudden he started acting really odd, super paranoid and super frightened. He went missing on July 8th, 2014. He was last seen on CCTV security footage running through the airport. He ran through the airport, jumped a fence outside, and then disappeared, and nobody has seen him since.
apparently when he was alone at the hotel waiting to fly home, he had called his mother. And his mother said that in a whisper, he told her that she needs to cancel all his credit cards because there were four men that were after him. Here's the weird part about this whole story. Lars was very likely lying about the whole bar fight that he told his friends about. His friends later said that it just, his story didn't add up and none of them think that it was actually true. It's speculated that maybe he had an accident or got injured in some other way and he was too embarrassed to tell his friends about it. And perhaps this injury that he got was maybe a really severe head injury and it caused some sort of psychotic break. Other guesses as to what was going on is that maybe he was on drugs or maybe the prescription that the doctor gave him for his injuries somehow gave him this really bad reaction and it again caused some sort of mental breakdown. Either way, any of those explanations would probably explain why he was running erratically through the airport, jumping a fence and then disappearing. And then maybe he died from his injuries or his head injury was actually really bad and he got lost and passed away that way. But Nobody knows for sure. The second story in tier one is Chris Watts. Now I'm sure many of you have heard of Chris Watts, if not all of you, since this was such a big story when it happened. I'll still give a really brief rundown as a refresher or for those of you who haven't heard about it. So on August 13th, 2018 in Colorado, Chris Watts murdered his pregnant wife, Shannon, plus their four-year-old daughter, Bella, and their three-year-old daughter, Celeste. Chris initially said that he had no idea what happened to his family and he reported them missing. But in probably the most satisfying video of all time, Chris Watts got caught red-handed in his own lie. Unknown to Chris at the time, his neighbor had a surveillance camera that had a clear shot of Chris's yard. The neighbor who was super eager to help Chris and the police find the family, the neighbor offered up the footage to the investigators. So the footage you're about to see is a body cam footage of the cop who was in this neighbor's house with Chris there as well. All of them watching this CCTV footage that Chris up until this point didn't know existed. Is this on continually yep. recording? Yep. Well, it's not. Is it motion, motion or is it event. okay? So it's motion. Any motion event that happens, I got. But I get cars driving from this street, from this street. These are still loading everything out there. All the tools I had to bring in. Because if there is any sort of action out there, his camera I would have got it. Like right. had, I had, we had issues the other other week when people were coming, were stealing stuff out of like garages and stuff like that. And I had parked my truck. I right had here. park right here. Yeah. So you someone, see if I can see where someone tried to jimmy with a flathead screwdriver. That's why her friend said it was low blood sugar. Let's see. Other than the fact that the video is so amazing because Chris just looks so uncomfortable because he knows he was just caught red-handed and he was gonna try to get away with this. The CCTV footage also showed that Shannon never left the house that day. And it also showed Chris suspiciously loading up his car in the driveway and then driving off in the early morning hours. So his story about the wife running off with the kids without him just didn't check out. The next one, we couldn't do this video, of course, Course, unfortunately without including Luca Magnata. Again, I don't think I need to go into too much detail about this one because most of you have probably seen the Netflix documentary or at least know this story now because it has been so sensationalized. But basically Luca really wanted to be famous and he had a hard time breaking into the model and film industry like he wanted. So he got really desperate to become famous at any cost and so he started filming himself being cruel to animals and posting those videos on the internet knowing that he would get a bunch of attention for them. Of course, he did get a lot of attention for him, so Luca then escalated. He escalated to luring a man named Jun Lin into his apartment through a Craigslist ad. Luca then filmed himself brutally murdering Jun Lin in his apartment, and he took this video, posted it to the internet, and called it 
one lunatic, one ice pick. The CCTV footage for this case, again, pretty infamous CCTV footage, shows Jun Lin and Luca entering his apartment and going upstairs together. And then later, after the murder occurred, more CCTV footage shows Luca wearing his victim's shirt and cleaning up the mess, basically. Again, for those of you that don't know, he was, of course, eventually caught and he is currently in jail. Like I said, this story gets really sensationalized. I find Jun Lin's story especially sad because he's often just this prop in the Luca Magnata story, when I think it should really be the other way around, like the Jun Lin story, how his life was cut way too short by a monster who saw living things as his toys. It just really sucks that Luca got what what he wanted all along, became notorious just like he wanted, even though it wasn't the original path he was going to take. Samantha Koenig. On February 1st, 2012 in Anchorage, Alaska, 18-year-old Samantha Koenig was working at a local coffee booth when a man pulls up and starts threatening her. He instructs her to turn off the light, he then robs her, and he abducts her. And all this is seen on the CCTV footage in the coffee booth. This man turned out to be serial killer Israel Keys. He went on to sexually assault her, he robbed her, he killed her, and then he put Samantha in a shed. He then left the next day for a cruise, a two-week cruise to New Orleans with his family. And on that cruise acted like everything is normal, and Samantha's body was in the shed the whole time. He then returned after his vacation, went back to her body, and put makeup on her and did her up to make her look alive, including sewing her eyes open. He put a recent paper next to her and took a picture and then used that to ask for a ransom. This is the photo that circulates online all the time and a lot of people refer to it as the real photo, but it's actually not the real ransom photo. It's a recreation of the photo that was like made for a TV show. The real ransom photo was never leaked. However, after he did this, he didn't wait for the ransom before he dismembered her body and just threw her in a lake. This was his last known murder before he got caught. And of course, while he was in jail awaiting trial, Israel died from suicide. So he never actually got the punishment he deserved. This is even more frustrating because it's very likely that Israel has way more victims than he ever let on and will never be able to try to get those answers from him. And there's probably a lot of other unsolved cases that we'll never know about just because he died before he could tell anybody. So another one we cannot make a CCTV video about without including is of course, Elisa Lamb. Again, not gonna go into too much detail because every one of you probably knows this story. But again, as a refresher, on February 19th, 2013, Elisa Lamb's body was discovered in the water tank on top of the Cecile Hotel in downtown LA. She had been staying at the hotel and her death was super sensationalized when the CCTV footage of her on the elevator before her death was released. She can be seen going in and out, hiding, gesturing, just overall acting very odd. This led people to believe that her disappearance and her ultimate death was either paranormal related or that she was playing some sort of elevator ritual, which I have a whole other video about if you need to know what that is. Others are still to this day sure that she was killed by somebody because it looks like in the video that she was being chased and she was hiding from somebody following her. But it was finally determined that Elisa was actually suffering from bipolar disorder and she had recently stopped taking her medication or at the very least she was really under medicating herself. This one's really hard because I feel like since it always gets sensational and I feel like Elisa is often exploited by the media as this super mystery when really it was just someone suffering from a mental illness and she happened to be unlucky enough for the worst possible outcome. Next in tier one is Dylan Roof, another one that like all in tier one, you've probably heard of. But even if you've heard of Dylan Roof, a lot of you probably didn't know that there is CCTV footage of him on the day of his crime. On June 17th, 2015 in South Carolina, 
Dylan Roof carried out a domestic terrorist attack against a black church, killing nine people. He said he did this to start a race war. He is currently on death row, but of course he's trying to appeal it. So there's CCTV footage of Dylan going into the church before he carries out the crime. And then he proceeds to sit in the service for 45 minutes with his future victims before he pulls out the gun and does this heinous thing. And then on the same security camera, he could be seen leaving the church, getting in his car and driving away, casual as can be. The next one on our list is Brian Schaefer. I've done a full in-depth video on him. Again, I'll have that linked somewhere probably. So if you wanna go see the full details on that, you can go watch that video. But basically Brian is seen on CCTV going into a bar with his friends. And then later on that footage, he is seen out right outside of the bar talking to a couple of women. He goes back into the bar and that's literally the last time anybody has seen him. It's one of the most infamous unsolved cases because it's just like every possible scenario that somebody comes up with has something majorly wrong with it and just every scenario seems impossible. Last in tier one is Missy Bevers. A lot of you have probably seen some of this security footage. Here's the story that goes along with it. 45 year old fitness instructor and mom of three was found stabbed to death on April 18th, 2016 in Texas. She had gone into her church a little bit after 4 a.m. to set up for a 5 a.m. fitness class that she was going to be instructing that morning. But when her students came to the class, they found Missy there dead. Some of the weirdest CCTV footage ever shows this person in full SWAT police gear wandering around the hallways with what looks like a hammer. And the hammer is consistent with the wounds that they later found on Missy. Her case is still unsolved to this day. Her husband, Brandon, has an alibi as he was 600 miles away on a fishing trip. However, Brandon's father, Missy's father-in-law, is a very high suspect in this case. He has a similar build as the person in the video. He has the same like gait as they kind of both have this like limp and he did have motivation. Apparently Brandon and Missy were having some marital problems. There was a rumor going around that Missy was having an affair on Brandon and that they were also having a lot of financial conflicts. It's thought that maybe Brandon's father agreed to kill his wife for him and that's why Brandon set up this 600 mile away fishing trip so that he would have a solid alibi. His father-in-law's alibi is that he was traveling to California at the time. Really I I mean, I personally think it is the father-in-law, but that's totally speculation and he has not been convicted or charged. There's just not enough evidence to prove that it was him. However, in spite of that, I do not believe in any way that Missy was a random attack. I think somebody knew her and was in there in the church waiting for her or looking for her and killed her and she was targeted. Those are all the cases in tier one. So we're gonna move down to tier two, which is just below the iceberg's tip. The first case in tier two is Jennifer Kesse. Jennifer Kesse went missing on January 23rd, 2006 in Orlando, Florida. She had gotten home from vacation with her boyfriend the Sunday before. She stayed the night at his house and went straight back to work the next morning. She called her parents around 6 p.m. that Monday and her boyfriend at about 10 p.m. that night. Her boyfriend is the last known person to speak to her. There's evidence that she made it home and there's even more evidence that she slept, got up the next day, and got ready for work. So therefore it is believed that she was abducted
interrupted sometime on her way to work. Her work alerted her parents pretty quickly that she hadn't come because it was very unlike Jennifer to just not show up for work, let alone not show up without a phone call. Her boyfriend, her friends, and her family were all ruled out as suspects. Her ex-boyfriend was a suspect for a while because he had been badgering her to get back together, but he was eventually ruled out. Her apartment was also undergoing a lot of renovations at the time, so there were construction workers all over the property all the time. And this wouldn't be a suspect, except Jennifer had complained to people a lot that the construction workers would catcall her and make inappropriate comments towards her when she was walking around the complex. So for a while, it was believed that it could have been one of them. However, the most popular suspect seems to be Johnny Campos. He was a coworker of Jennifer's who had asked her out repeatedly, and Jennifer had always declined his proposals. He was acting extremely strange at work and otherwise right after Jennifer's disappearance. I'm not gonna go into all the details, but if you read about the details, it's really fascinating how suspicious this guy was acting. But the only real evidence they ever got in Jennifer's case was CCTV footage. After vanishing, Jennifer's car was found parked about a mile from her home. A local security camera recorded a person parking her car and walking away but unfortunately they can't ID the person in the video. The bars on the fence just line up too perfectly with the person's face and so perfectly you can't see or identify the person. What's really creepy is that this footage was taken only a few hours after Jennifer had been abducted that morning. The next one is the London Jogger. This one took place in May of 2017. Footage came out that is now referred to as the Putney Bridge Jogger. A jogger can be seen just running along and one man passes him and nothing happens. And then in the video, a woman passes him and he just shoves her into traffic. This is one of the few stories in this video about a person that doesn't actually die. Thankfully, the victim was pushed out in front of a bus, but the bus was able to swerve away from her body and she turned out to be okay. But as far as we know, this was a completely random attack. We have no idea why the jogger did this, what his motivation was, why he targeted her, and just so carelessly just threw somebody out into busy traffic and it's never been solved and nobody's been able to identify him. Next is the kidnapping of Carly Jane Brucia. On February 1st, 2004 in Sarasota, Florida, 11 year old Carly is abducted from a car wash on her way home from a friend's house. A man named Joseph Smith can be seen on CCTV grabbing her arm and leading her away. Joseph Smith was a 37 year old father of three. He had just gotten out of prison a year prior and was currently on probation when he did this. Carly was then sexually assaulted and brutally murdered by him. They finally found Carly's body a few days later behind a church after her abduction. She died from strangulation. Joseph proceeded to get two life sentences and the death penalty. Here's a doozy for ya, James Bulger. On February 12th, 1993 in England, two-year-old James Bulger was abducted from a shopping center and was never seen alive again. Two days after his abduction, his body was found mutilated in Liverpool. Everyone assumed it was some adult predator that took him away and did this to him, but to everyone's complete horror, it was somehow worse. The CCTV footage in the shopping center shows two 10 year old boys, Robert Thompson and John Venables, leading little James out of the building. They took James to a secluded area and severely tortured him. After they were done torturing him, they laid his body down on railroad tracks and weighted it down, hoping that a train would run him over and the whole thing would look like an accident. A train, by the way, did end up hitting his body, but James was already dead at this point. The boys were caught and they were found guilty, which made them the youngest convicted murderers of the 20th century. However, both boys were 
only 10 years old at the time of the crime, so they were tried as kids. So they were released from prison in the early 2000s. John has been in and out of prison ever since he got out, sometimes for CP charges. And Robert has not been convicted of any more crimes since it happened. However, they've both changed their names and their current identities and locations, everything about them is protected because they are at very high risk of vigilante justice. But can I just say how like, it's so upsetting how purely evil two 10 year old boys could be to think so far in advance, not only of killing somebody and planning a murder, but also thinking and having the forethought to make it look like an accident, to try and get away with it and make it look like he had just been run over by a train. Like what happened to them? I mean, this case is just impossible for me to wrap my head around. Next is the story of Kanika Jenkins. On September 8th, 2017, 19 year old Kanika Jenkins went to a party at the Crown Plaza Chicago O'Hare Hotel in Illinois. Everyone at the party was drinking alcohol, so Kanika was drinking with her friends. She had also taken a drug that was known for treating epilepsy, even though she wasn't on that as a prescription. This is only important because that particular drug can enhance the effects of alcohol and vice versa. They didn't arrive at the party until 11.30 p.m. and Kanika gets separated from her friends a few hours later. Her friends can't find her, so finally around 4 a.m. they call her mom and her mom rushes to the hotel. This story has a very tragic ending though. They eventually find Kanika's body in one of the walk-in freezers in one of the unused kitchens in the hotel. The death was eventually ruled an accident slash dying from hypothermia. This case is often criticized for the lack of urgency that police showed when Kanika was reported missing, which highlights that just often black people going missing are just not cases taken as seriously as white people. But it's argued that it's possible she could be alive if they took it more seriously and were able to find her quicker. There's also a lot of doubt from her family and many others about the case from this day being just an accident. There's no actual footage of Kanika going into the freezer by herself with nobody else involved. The other question is how did Kanika, as you can see on the security footage, could barely keep herself up and could barely walk because she was inebriated. How did she open a heavy freezer door and manage to lock herself inside when she couldn't walk without the support of the wall? And this is supported by the CCTV footage that they found of her stumbling around the hotel shortly before disappearing. Next is the murder of Alan Wood. On October 24th, 2009, 50 year old Alan Wood left his favorite pub and was never seen alive again. His friend found him three days later at his home and it was clear that Alan had been bound and tortured before he was killed. This case was very shocking to everyone around him because Alan Wood had no known enemies. He was a really easygoing, friendly, nice guy. The only motive they could figure out was that somebody stole some of his money and his bank cards were missing. So for the CCTV footage, they have footage of a man who used his bank cards at the ATM. This case is still unsolved and it will probably be unsolved for possibly forever because police believe that whoever carried out this murder, the person on the CCTV footage probably fled the country right after this happened. Next is Trevor Dealey. On December 8th, 2000 in Dublin, Trevor Dealey was walking home from his office's Christmas party around 4 a.m. He stopped at the bank that he worked at on his way home since he worked in the IT department and security let him into the building. There is CCTV footage that captured Trevor, as well as a man dressed in dark clothing nearby that Trevor shortly interacted with on tape. It's widely assumed that this man, whoever he was, had something to do with Trevor's disappearance. But unfortunately, this has also never been solved. Next is Rudy Eugene. This one was one of the stories that was included on my Disturbing Things That Happen to Real People episode one video. So if you want full details on this case, you can watch that video. But Rudy Eugene was 
was in 2012. He was walking down the highway after his car broke down. He started stripping off all his clothes and eventually runs into a man who was homeless named Ronald Popo. He attacked the man, stripping him of his clothing as well. He then started to eat the man's face, taking so many bites out of it that practically nothing was left. There is CCTV footage of their partially blocked bodies while Rudy was attacking Ronald. Rudy died at the scene after officers were forced to shoot him to death. And I don't usually agree with officers shooting people, but they did tell him to stop. They tried everything and they finally shot him once and he still didn't stop attacking this man. There was no way to get him off of him without them being in severe danger. And so they ended up sadly killing him. Ronald, the victim, fortunately survived. It's suspected that the drug bath salts were probably responsible for Rudy's behavior, but this has not been confirmed. This is not necessarily a fact. Second to last in this tier is former President Bush aide John Wheeler. 66-year-old John Wheeler, who was a former aide for the Bush administration, went missing at the end of 2010. On December 29th of this year, he is seen on CCTV footage talking to a parking attendant in a parking garage. He looked really disoriented and he was wearing only one shoe. He told the attendant that he just wanted to warm up before he paid the parking fee but it turns out that his car wasn't even at that garage. He told her that his briefcase had been stolen and he also just insisted that he was not intoxicated. He was spotted on December 30th as well, so we know he was still alive at that point. But the next day on December 31st, his body was found in a landfill by a landfill worker. They ultimately said that his cause of death was blunt forced trauma and assault. Though no further explanation has ever really been given, and this case pretty much also remains a mystery. Last in tier two, and the last one for part one, is a woman named Colleen Ritzer, who maybe you've heard of, or at least seen some flashes of this video around. In October of 2013, CCTV footage shows 24-year-old Colleen Ritzer, who was a teacher at a high school, going to the restroom. A couple minutes later on the surveillance footage, you can see 14-year-old Philip Chisholm following Colleen out of the classroom, first looking up and down the hallway and seeming to hesitate and think about what he was going to do. He then goes back in the classroom, puts his hood up, and then follows her into the bathroom where he would slash her throat and stab her a total of 16 times. He then sexually assaulted her body. The footage then shows him with a bin that contained her body. With this bin and her body in it, he took her outside behind the school and dumped her body in the woods, burying her in a very shallow grave of leaves. From my understanding, he received a minimum of 40 years in prison, but after that, he might be eligible for parole, which is very disheartening for Colleen's family, of course. The reason for the light sentence, of course, like always, is because he was under 18 at the time. He was only 14 years old when he did this. But the footage in this whole case is just so horrible and so unsettling. Okay, that's gonna be it for part one. Please come back or if you're not subscribed, subscribe so that you can see part two, which we will talk about tier three, four, and five of this iceberg. I will get it out as soon as I can. Even though the stories in this video are horrible, if you could still like the video, if you thought it was interesting, that would be great and would help me out a lot. Thank you guys so much for watching and I will see you in